covering those sins or coming out of those sins, repenting of those sins, or it can show the consequences of individuals not taking personal responsibility. For example, here's a good example of, of personal responsibility uh, uh, in a failure, a failure of personal responsibility, and that usually is individuals blame someone else. Now, now think about this. How many times do you hear someone uh, or you see someone who's made a mistake and what they do is they blame someone else? Pass the buck, you might say. Well, think about this. In Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3 uh, and verse uh, 9 is where we're going to start. Notice what, what, what happens. Here we are in the Garden of Eden. God has placed man in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says, The Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now we know what has happened. Adam and Eve, they've both, they both eaten of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, <clears throat> and their eyes were opened and they realized they're naked. And so he says, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so now the Lord asked the question. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? All right, now here's the answer. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. All right, look at that. Immediately, immediately we're passing a buck. It wasn't my fault, it was the woman's fault. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even the woman's fault, it was your fault. You gave me the woman. See what Adam's doing? He does not want to assume the personal responsibility of violating the command that God gave that of the tree of the garden, tree in the midst of the garden, the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. All the other trees you can eat of. But when he did it, when he, when he took the, the fruit, he says, well, the woman, you know, the woman that you gave me, she, she gave it to me and didn't eat. Now, friends, that is a classic example of someone not bearing personal responsibility. It is a classic example of an individual trying to pass the buck and trying to say, well, you know what, it's really, it's really not me. Here's another example. Here's another example of, of that. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at Exodus 32 and verse 21. In Exodus 32 and verse 21, here's uh, uh, Aaron. Aaron and the, and the children of Israel are at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Moses is up on top of Mount, Mount Sinai receiving the law. And while Moses is up on, uh, up on the mountain, he's been there 40 days, and, and, and the people think, well, he's not coming down. You know, they think he's dead. And so they, they ask Aaron, you know, build us a golden calf. Build us a calf. Build us a God that we can worship. And so uh, Moses comes down, and listen to what he says. Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? You've made this golden calf. What did they do to you that you called, that you brought this in? Now Moses is putting all the blame squarely on Aaron. Look what Aaron does. Aaron turns around, he passed the buck. Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. You know those people. They're just all crazy. They're just set on mischief. You know they're troublemakers. You know how they are. You know? You know how they are. So don't be mad at me. You know what kind of people they are. He said, For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out, out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. We don't know what's happened, so you need to make us some gods. And so Aaron says, now remember, it's still the people's fault. But Aaron said unto them, what, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So the people gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Wow, that's pretty impressive. You just throw some gold into the fire and all of a sudden here comes a calf out. Wow. See, he, he's not taking responsibility. What I thought I did was throw some gold in the fire. And it, and it, you know, when it was molten and everything, it came out of this calf. Boy, that's a, that's a magic trick all right, isn't it? See, so he's not assuming responsibility. Friends, there is a reason why I believe today people don't take responsibility. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But the idea that people are shirking their responsibility is something that certainly is not new. Here's another example in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, and we're going to look in verse 13, starting at verse 13. Now here again, now we have Saul, King Saul, the first king of, of Israel, <clears throat> and he is told to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. And Samuel 
uh, comes down to him, and, and here's what Saul does. Saul comes to him. Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now God told him to utterly destroy everything, all the, all the people and all the livestock, don't take any spoils, whatever. And he says, I've done that. So Samuel comes down, and Samuel said unto him, said, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now the people did it. Friends, what kind of king, what kind of king do you think Saul was? To then say, well, the people disobeyed me. Can you imagine a leader passing the buck like this? But it happens all the time. It happens on a very regular basis, does it not? You know, the person in charge said, well, the people, the people, they, they did it. Well, really what you're doing is you're indicting yourself, are you not? Isn't, isn't uh, Saul really uh, uh, putting the light shining back on himself when he, he's trying to deflect it? But really, it's shining back on him. He says, the people did it. The people, the people did it. See, they, they spared it. Well, then you must not be a very good king. They must not respect you as someone in authority to go against your command, to go against your orders. So whose fault was it? They did it? They just took it upon themselves to defy you? See that? And so he's going to have to say, well, yeah, they're, they're disobedient people. Well, you must not be a very good king. Oh, no, I'm a good king. Well, then, so you must have given the order. You must have given the okay that it was okay to spare the, the animals. Which is it? You see, when you start shirking responsibility, it's always going to come to light whose fault really it is. Whose fault really it is. And so, uh, then we come on down. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine, eye, in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king of Israel? And the Lord sent sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen to what Saul does. Saul comes back and here's what he says. Samuel says, you, You've utterly, <clears throat> you've sinned. You've done evil in the sight of the Lord. You did not obey. And Saul comes right back and says, Yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Can you believe that? Oh, yes, I have done it. I've done exactly what God said. The only exception is I didn't do what God said, but I did what God said. That sounds like Richard Dawkins, doesn't it? Sounds like what uh, Brother Johnny was playing right before this. You know, all the double speak. Well, I did what the Lord said, except from the, in the fact that I didn't do what the Lord said, but other than that, I did what the Lord said. He said, oh, yes, I did. I, I, I obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I have gone, I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I have brought Agag, the king of Amaclite, and utterly destroyed the rest. No, that's not what God said. God said utterly destroy them all. And you said, well, I did exactly what the Lord said do, except I didn't do what the Lord said. There's so many applications you can make here, friends, where individuals try to shirk responsibility. They, don't, they, they want to pass the buck. They don't want to take the, the personal uh, responsibility of being disobedient. How many times have you heard people say, well, I obeyed the Lord. I obeyed the voice of the Lord. I just, I just played. He told me to sing in worship. He told me to sing in worship, and so I did that, but I played too, but, but I did what the Lord said. Okay, Saul, just talk to Saul about that because God was not convinced. Samuel was not convinced, but Saul was trying to convince himself that he obeyed. Now, look what, what uh, uh, the Bible goes on and says. But the people, again, here he is passing the book to people, but the people took of the spoil. Well, you spared the king, so it must have been okay if you violate the commands of God. It must be okay for them to do it. But the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of ram. God wants obedience. And so you can pass the buck and you say, well, the people, the people made me do it or the people, you know, the, the, the people disobeyed and so forth. It's still on you. Saul, you're the king. When, 
Friends, when you get down, when it gets down to individuals having a personal responsibility, it's going to be on them. It's going to be on them. It's going to be on them to, to assume the responsibility with their parents. It's on them to assume the responsibility to, tra to train up their child, to discipline their child, to correct their child, to teach them respect, to teach them to be good citizens. All right? And so if, if that is the case, if it's the case where that does not happen, then someone has to take responsibility. Someone has to take responsibility for what's done wrong. Now, here's a good example of, of, of what we're talking about here. You may remember this headline. I don't think it's back in December. Uh, young man down in, in, uh, in, in Texas uh, uh, was drunk driving, and he killed a family. And uh, his plea, his plea for innocency, or not guilty, was that, well... I'm affected with affluenza. And his argument was, my mom and dad did not teach me right and wrong, and therefore, therefore, I, I you know, I just, I just don't know what's right and wrong. It's not my fault. Well, you know what? If, if, if it were me, then the judge, and the judge, you know, let him go on that. Gave him a reduced sentence or whatever. But here's the problem. The problem is that the, the son and the parents should have been held responsible. But they're all shirking. The parents shirked their responsibility, did not train their child up correctly, apparently. Or even if they did, they tried to instill it into him, he is going to have to take responsibility for this or should have been. Can you imagine, can you imagine standing before the God Almighty on the judgment seat and saying, well, Lord, you know, my parents didn't teach me right or wrong, therefore, free pass. No, friends, the responsibility is going to fall squarely on your shoulders. As we just read in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we're all standing before the judgment of Christ. You cannot shirk responsibility. You can't put it off on someone else. You can't say, well, my, my parents didn't tell me. My parents didn't. You know, in, uh, in John chapter 9, in John chapter 9, we read about a man who was healed, who was blind. And, and Christ heals the man. Let's come on down here uh, and, uh, and, and let's just look at what uh, what happened? All right. When he had thus had spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay a spittle, and anointed the eyes of the, of the the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go into the pool of Siloam, which be interpreted. And he went by his way, and he washed, and he came uh, uh, seeing. And the neighbors, no, no, and the neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, This is. He, others said, he is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore they said unto him, How were thine eyes open? And he said unto them, A man called Jesus who made clay anointed mine eyes, uh, uh, anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Verse 12. And they said unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. And they brought, and, and they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day. And Jesus, that Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, the Pharisees asked him and said, How he received his sight? And he said unto them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I, and I received my sight. And I do see. And the Pharisees said, This man, uh, you know, they're, they're questioning him here. And uh, they said, He's a prophet. But notice here, I'm coming down here. They come to, uh, they come to the parents. And the Jews did not believe uh, concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. And so they called the parents of him that received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? And his parents answered and said, We know this is our, own, our son, and that he was born blind. But by what manner he, see, he now seeth, we know not, or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. In other words, they, in a way, they were kind of shirking responsibility too. They didn't want to answer because they were afraid that they were going to be put out of synagogue, the very next verse says. They were afraid if they confessed that they were going to be put out of synagogue. And so they kind of passed a button. They put it back on him. But they said, he's of age. You need to ask him. Friends, everybody is going to have to have some, some personal responsibility here. Now, here's what, here's what I'm, uh, I'm wanting to impress upon our minds. You know, when we're talking about we're talking about uh, 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 personal responsibility. It is a failure of personal responsibility to pass the buck. 
just like this young man. But you know, when you think about a failure of response, uh, personal responsibility, what about the idea of let's let someone else do it for me? Let someone else provide for me. Now, I believe this is a great example of a failure of responsibility in our society. Because this mindset of let someone else do it for me is running rampant. Individuals today do not assume personal responsibility. And they're content to let someone else do it for them. For example, listen to what, what, what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, now we read where uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden, but did you realize that when God, when God made Adam and Eve, when he put them in the garden, he did it for a reason? I mean, he, he made them uh, for a particular reason. Genesis 2 and verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, where he put the man whom he had formed. Now, what was man going to do in that garden? Well, let's come down to verse, eight, uh, verse 15. Verse 15. <clears throat> and the Lord God took the man and put him in the, in the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. God created man to work. Man was designed. He was made to work. But yet individuals today want to say, well, you know what, I, I'm going to pass some of that personal responsibility. I, I'm not going to work. I'm not going to work. I'm content to let someone else work for me. You know what Solomon said? When Solomon was, was experimenting, he was trying to find happiness. He was trying to find, you know, the, the meaning of life, if you will. And he, he gave himself to do a whole lot of things. He gave himself over to, to, uh, uh, to knowledge. He went, he went got air, all the kinds of learning he could. He gave himself over to wine and women and and all kinds of uh, 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 fleshly desires, anything that his heart desired, he, he, he did it. He's trying to find uh, uh, what's the best thing in life. And he came to the conclusion it's all vanity. It's all vanity. He even gave himself to building, great buildings and, and, and so forth. But here's what he says. Here's one thing he says. He says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? In other words, here's what you need to realize. You need to realize that you don't know what's going to happen after you die. You don't know who's going to come along and take everything you worked for. You need to rejoice in your own works. You need to, you need to be content in, in, in producing something. Now, there's a lot of people today go, you know what? I, I'm happy. I'm content with someone else producing. I'm happy with someone else providing for me. You know what, friends, that is, that is a, a serious character flaw because that means you are saying, I'm not going to assume the responsibility of my own work. Look at this Bible principle. Here's a principle in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse uh, 7, Paul says this. He says, Who goeth to warfare? any time of his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? In other words, the, the farmer and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the rancher, they work, they labor, they put in time and effort into raising a crop or raising a flock, and it is their right then to eat of what they've earned, of what they, to, to, to uh, uh, be given something that... Uh, 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 to, to be given part of, of, of the, uh, uh, the fruits of their labor, you might say. Now, who doesn't do that? But now here's what our society says. The individual that wants to shirk responsibility wants to say, well, you've, you've planted a vineyard. I want to eat of your vineyard. You've raised a flock. I want to eat of your flock. But that's not the principle. The principle is if you work for it, then you should be able to partake of it. Paul said, Say I these things as a man, or say, saith not the law, the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox uh, that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Now, for he, or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. In other words, if you're working, you have a 
a right to expect something for your labor, something for, a reward for your labor. On the flip side of that, if you don't work, why then do you have a hope of receiving something? Why do you have a hope of getting something for which you have not labored? Why should you have a, of a hope of receiving an abundance of something that you have not earned, you haven't really worked for? That's why the lottery's wrong, friends. I know this man down here in, in uh, North Carolina somewhere just on the radio today, you know, he, he's hit the lottery twice. Well, you know what he's doing? He's, he's, got, he's got a reward for nothing. Now, other people, other people have sold, and they've sold, they put their money in there, and they're not getting anything back from it. See that? And so, but if you're working diligently with your hands, and you're providing an honest work, providing things honest in the sight of all men, that's what Paul's going to say in 2 Corinthians 8, you have, a, you have a right to, to expect some kind of reward, some kind of uh, uh, a reward for your labors. And these individuals say, well, you know, this guy, he, he, he made a lot of money. He's wealthy. He's made a lot of money. And uh, therefore, he doesn't deserve it. No, he does deserve it. He does deserve it. You should work hard too. Now, I'm not talking about individuals who have, who have uh, gotten rich and gotten wealthy by dishonest means. But there's plenty of individuals who have worked hard and who have made for themselves a very nice living and they have earned that. And so there's a Bible principle there that says you have a right to, to reward for your labors. Now, if you're shirking responsibility, you're saying, I want, I want uh, some, the reward of someone else's labor. Do you remember the little... The little story about the, 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 the red hen, you know, the, the little red hen. You know, she said, who wants to help me plant the wheat? No one did. Who wants to help me uh, uh, water the wheat? No one did. Who wants to help me harvest the wheat? No one did. Who wants to help me thresh out the wheat? No one did. Who wants to help me grind the wheat? No one. Who wants to help me uh, make dough? Nobody did. She bakes the bread. The bread comes out of the oven. Everybody smells it. Boy, I want some of that. Uh-uh. You didn't do a thing. You didn't lift a finger. If you're going to work, then you can expect something in return. But don't expect someone else to do it for you. Now notice this. Here's shirking responsible, personal responsibility. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said, If any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own household, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. To fail to provide for your own is a serious crime. You know, there's a lot of individuals. They shirked that personal responsibility let someone else care for their own. Now, what's an example of that? Well, how about this? How about this? How about this for personal, uh, an example of shirking personal responsibility? How about individuals who have babies? And then they don't take care of those children. How about individuals who shack up for a night? They're not married. They, they shack up with a girl. She gets pregnant, has a baby, and now you're going to let well. You know what? She can go get on welfare. She let the government take care of it. Where do you think the government is? Where do you think the government gets their money? The government gets their money from other individuals who have been out working. And it's a failure of personal responsibility for you to say, I'm going to let someone else take care of my child. You're a deadbeat dad. You're a deadbeat mom, too. A lot of, a lot of moms say, you know what, I'm just going to, get, I'm going to, to uh, let the government take care of my kids. I'm not, going, I'm not going to do anything unless I just absolutely have to to raise my child. You know what? I know there's a lot of grandparents out there who are raising their grandchildren. Now, some, on some instances, maybe it's, a, it's kind of a necessity. Maybe you're helping your child out. But I think a lot of times, a lot of times, it's just sorry, no good kids. You failed as your ch with your children somewhere. I would, I would never think about asking my 
mother or my wife's parents for, to, to raise my children. That's my responsibility. If you're a man or, and a woman enough to bring a child to the world, then you ought to take the responsibility to care for them. See how that goes? All right? Don't be shirking personal responsibility. But a lot of times people, well, they, they expect something. They expect something for nothing. Now, let me just, I'm going to get into some, probably some trouble right here, but let me just talk about this. Friends, do you realize that our society, we actually encourage a failure of personal responsibility. We actually encourage that. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, consider this. In our country, we have unemployment benefits. Now, I don't know what the benefit of being unemployed is. That sounds like a contradiction in terms to me. But I know what it means. It means that you're getting paid, you're, you're getting some money while you are out of work. Now, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with, with, with help. If you've paid in to a system a little bit, you ought to get something back. Uh, uh, if you're putting into a system that's supposed to help you in the event that you lose your job, you should get that back out. But 99 weeks, our government pays individuals for not, will pay them for 99 weeks if they don't have a job. Friends, think about that, 99 weeks. That's, well, that's not very really long. 99 weeks is five weeks short of two years. Now, what do you think happens after two years? Most people, most people are going to say, you know what, I've got a check coming in. I've got a check coming in. That's my job. I'll make more getting unemployment than I would if I go out and get a job. So it's easy for me now. Now I'm being cared for. Friends, I guarantee you people haven't paid into the system. They haven't paid into a system that will carry them for two years. If you've been saving up enough to, to carry you for two years, then you've been doing good. But you know, you're letting you're letting the government do it for you. Individuals who want the government to care for them and to provide for them are shirking their personal responsibility to take care of themselves and take care of their own. But see, our society is, uh, our government or the powers that be, whoever, they're encouraging this. You know how I know? Because not only do they say we're going to pay 99 weeks of unemployment, two years of individuals who can't find a job, now we're going to say, you know what, now we're going to eliminate the work requirements to get some of these benefits. In other words, you don't even have to be looking for a job. Or some of the, 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 the welfare or government assistant, assistant programs, that, well, you, know, you don't have to work. Well, why would you? You know why some of these infomercials tell you, well, you know, try it for, try it for 21 days. Try it for 21 days. Try it for a month. You know why they say that? Because they know that if you do something, if you do something for 21 days, you're going to keep on doing it. In other words, it's, it's like 21 days to form a habit. If you do something for 21 days, you're going to keep it up. Well, what do you think that does when individuals say, well, you know what, I've got a, I've got a government check coming in for six months, two, week, two years. Now I'm used to it. Now I'm used to it. I have no in, incentive to go out and, and do something, to provide for my own. And so, uh, Richard, I don't think our phone is, is on in here. So, so here's what we're talking about. People are, are being discouraged to work. Now, 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 here's what I'm talking about. Look at this. Look at this. Food stamp. Food stamp spending has more than doubled since 2008. Now, friends, again, I, I'm not, I don't have a problem with individuals being, being assisted. I don't have a problem with individuals being assisted. But when people are encouraged, but when people are encouraged to let someone else provide for them, there's the problem. Since 2008, it's, it's, it's doubled. Here, here's, here's a quote. In 2008, taxpayers spent $38 billion on food stamps. In 2013, that figure will be $82 billion. 
And so individuals who are actually working, providing for themselves, now they're not only providing for themselves, they're having to pay for individuals who aren't working at all. Now, I don't have a problem, like I said, I don't have a problem with, with individuals who truly need help. But, you know what, friends, I just have a hard time believing. I have a hard time believing that this number of people need assistance. Especially when you have our, our government going out and saying to foreign countries, telling individuals in Mexico, hey, look what we'll do for you. It's all about power. And it's shirking the responsibility that God has given to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, for personal responsibility. It's actually undermining what God says is best for man. Now, you want another quote on this? Consider this. The number of able-bodied adults without dependents, able-bodied adults without dependents on food stamps doubles. Why would an able-bodied individual even need to be on food stamps? An able-bodied individual without independence. That's a single man or a single woman. Why are they on the government assistance? Do you think it might be because they've been conditioned to think that way? They've been conditioned to not assume personal responsibility for taking care of themselves? They've been conditioned to say, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to go out and work for my, my, my food. There's individuals who think that they're owed something. We live, in the, we live in, the, in the freest nation in the world. And if you can't make it in this country, friends, you can't make it. But if you don't want to make it in this world, then you need to starve. You need to go hungry. The Bible says, the Bible says, if any man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Let's look at this, 2 Thessalonians 3. In verse 10, For when we were with you, and we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he, should he eat. So what we, need to, what we need to consider is, we need to consider who's being responsible here. Who's being responsible? You see, individuals who say, well, I'm, I'm just going to give it a pass. All you're doing is you're not only hurting yourself, but you're hurting your neighbor. You know, I hear all this stuff about love your neighbor, you know, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. But yet the individuals who are expecting their neighbor to carry them, they don't really love their neighbor. You know, I heard this, I heard someone make this observation. I think it's, I think it's very true. They said during the Great Depression when it was so hard to find work, the only a way a lot of people made it was they, they very reluctantly, they asked their family members or their church. And it was a shame to be without a job. It was a shame not to be able to provide for your own family. But see, today, today, you don't have to go begging to be your family. You don't have to go begging the churches, even though some people do. It's on, it's on. You don't have to go begging for that. You know why? Because the government will come and take it from your neighbor and give it to you and so you don't have to ask. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 30, uh, 10 and verse 18, it says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. Laziness, slothfulness, is a detriment to the individual and to a society. And the shirking personal responsibility is a good example of, of why that's happening. Proverbs 12, verse 27, The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. If you don't go hunting, then you're not going to be eating. See that? But the substance of the diligent man is precious. You enjoy the fruits of your labors. And if, you want to, and if you want to eat, then go out and get it. Don't expect someone to just hand it to you on a silver platter. Here's another proverb, Proverb 18, verse 9. 
He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that's a great waster. You know why? Because, friends, here's, here's what you can do. You can take this to the bank. An individual that doesn't work for what they have, an individual who's given everything, they don't care if they waste it or not. That, it's, it's not there. They didn't, they, didn't put, they didn't put any sweat into it. You don't believe that's the case? Why do you think that government doesn't mind throwing money at all kinds of programs and all kinds of, uh, of, of problems? Because it's not their money. So the government runs on taxes. And so the government takes from other people and says, oh, I think I'll spend this money. It's not mine. But friend, as an individual, they're no different. Because the individuals who take money that really belongs to other individuals, who don't do anything or don't work or don't labor, who don't take personal responsibility for their efforts, they're doing the same thing. And they say, well, I'll just throw it. I'll just waste it. I'll spend it on whatever I want to. You don't believe that's the case? You don't, you don't believe that's the case? Let me just uh, uh, let me skip over a few slides here. And let me just give you an example of this. This is from the Denver Post. Use of public assistance cards are okay at pot shops. Pot shops. In other words, the Denver uh, 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 government, elected officials, are scrambling to put a law in place where individuals who use their EBT cards, that is their, their food stamp card, can't go to an ATM machine that's located inside a marijuana dispensary because now in Colorado it's legal for recreational marijuana uh, use. So they have to make it where you can't go and take your government card and get money back to buy your pot. Now, I don't know why they, don't, they think that somebody can't get money back from, from some of those uh, uh, um, programs. I believe the TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, you actually get cash back. If you go to a store or whatever, you can get some cash back. Well, what's some stopping from taking the cash and going out and using the pot? You know why? And smoking, and smoking marijuana, you know why? It's not going to stop them because individuals who have not worked and earned that money don't care about where it goes. But if someone who has worked and earned and saved and put some, some time and effort into saving up something, they're going to be careful and they're going to be frugal and they're going to say, you know what, I worked for this. I want to make sure I spend it wisely because it's mine. I earned it. And God knows that's how. That's why. That's why I said, he that is he that's slothful is brother him that's a waster because they're using things that are not theirs. And it gets down to a lack of personal responsibility. A lack of personal responsibility. Um, the Bible says in Proverbs 19 and verse 15, it says, Slothfulness catcheth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. See, the Bible is telling we need to be personally responsible for our actions. But I, I wonder why. Why is that the case? Why is failure of personal responsibility? Why is that so reverent? Friends, I, sub I submit to you because people have been conditioned to want something for nothing. And it's not just because they've been getting the daily dole from the state or from the government. They get it, they get it in the pew. They get it from the pulpit. When they go to church on Sunday, guess what they get? They get conditioned to receive something for nothing. They get conditioned to say, you know what? I, hey, I can't do anything for myself. I, 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 just can't, I just can't make it on my own. Now you think about this, friends. The individual, the individual who in life, in his secular life says, you know what? I need someone to buy my food. I need someone to pay for my TV and my, for my for my housing, I need, I need someone to pay for my cell phone. These are the same individuals 
You know, we say, no, you, you need to have some personal responsibility. You need, to, you need to own some of this. If you want it, you need to do something for it. But then they turn around and they go to church and they hear people go, well, you know what? You don't have to do anything. For the greatest gift, the greatest gift that a man can have, you don't do anything. You don't have any personal responsibility for this. Here's a caller from the other night, a couple weeks ago. Listen to what this man says. Listen to what this man says. He's talking about understanding the Bible. Can't do it on your own. Step on in a little bit. You're on the Word of the Lord. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a comment about the uh, Bible. I, I go by the King James Version, and I think that one thing that's about religion uh, is people are confused about what to believe because you hear one pastor interpret the Bible seem to be different than what some other pastor interprets. Uh, I think to really understand the Bible, one has to be inspired to uh, to understand what the Bible is about. And it's just like... Uh, no, no, wait a minute. Say that again. In order to understand the Bible, a person has to be inspired? Inspired by the uh, Holy Spirit to, uh, to understand it you know, interpret it or whatever. Now, how do you come to that conclusion? Well, I mean, I'm coming to that conclusion because uh, I'm hearing different pastors, I feel, oftentimes, uh, maybe confusing the general public about Christianity or whatever. Right. And right let, let's get back to what you said about, though, being inspired to understand the Bible. I mean, if that's the case, then if someone doesn't understand the Bible... Whose fault is it? Uh, someone doesn't what? If someone does not understand the Bible, and, and they need to be inspired to understand the Bible, whose fault is it if they don't understand the Bible? Well, I think it's the person's fault that uh, doesn't understand it. I'm saying. No, wait a minute. But you said he had to be inspired to understand it. Well, I don't think you get my point. The point is, uh, there are things in the Bible. I don't think everybody understands. It's just like you talk. But here, here's my point, though, sir. I, I understand all that. But here's my point. You said if a person a person needs to be inspired to understand the Bible. Is that right? Yes. Uh-huh. All right. Now, if I don't understand the Bible, whose fault is it since I'm not inspired? Well, I'd say it's a person that doesn't understand its fault. No, no. You, but, sir, you said I have to be inspired to understand it. Who gives me the inspiration? It would be God. It comes from God, just like Moses. Okay. When he uh, went up on oh. the mountain and came okay. down. Okay. Now, now, but know, now listen. Was, uh, now listen. This, this was really the first laws of God. Okay, sir. But, but listen. Was the tenth commandment. Hang on a second, sir. So I have to be inspired to understand the Bible, and I get inspiration from the Holy Spirit or from God. Now, if I never am inspired and therefore I cannot understand the Bible, whose fault is it? Well, we we're repeating ourselves. You no, know, because uh, you're not answering the question, sir. You're saying you're saying it's my fault if I'm not inspired, but inspiration comes from God. So if I never uh, understand the Bible, it's God's fault. That's what you're saying. Well, that's my feelings about it. It's like I don't understand how one could be a, an atheist because. All right, he said he didn't understand how one could be an atheist because what? I can, according to his reasoning. If a person reads the Bible, they can't understand it unless God does something for them. That's my point, friends. Everybody wants God to do something for them. God has already done everything he can for you. Why can't you do something for yourself? These individuals are saying, well, God needs to inspire me to understand his book. God wrote the book so that you can understand it. Now, what more does he need to do? In Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians chapter 3... In verse 4, here's what, what the Bible says. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul is writing and he says, look, when you read, you can understand. All you have to do is read. Now, he's right. If someone doesn't understand, it's that person's fault because they they're not trying to understand it. But it's not because they haven't been inspired or illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That's what our Baptist and Cap Calvinist friends would say. Well, God has to do it for you. God does it for you. See, and so I submit to you that people are being 
conditioned to take something for nothing that they have to be everything has to be done for them you know and like I said we get we get upset we say well you know these people that want everything uh, they want to sign up for these programs and get food and clothing and shelter whatever they need to go out and do something oh when it comes to oh you can't do anything for yourself when it comes to salvation oh really how about how about God has done his part and now you do your part but see we're conditioned we got this we got this uh, 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 communist conditioning if you will when it comes to religion you know well everybody you know you can't do it for yourself the government has to do it for you God has to do it for you listen to what this Baptist preacher says um, well the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 2 verse 8 9 for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself it is a gift of God not of works least any man should boast and like I said, please don't under, misunderstand me. I'm not making light of baptism because baptism is very important. But salvation is a gift of God. Now, if a gift of God, if it's a gift, then it's freely given to us without us having to do anything for it. Then adding baptism to salvation is adding works to salvation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. God forbid we do anything. Even though the Bible clearly says we do something, we have a part in it. Why don't you take some personal responsibility, friends, and do what God requires for you to do in regard to your salvation? Here's what I mean by this. Notice this. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Peter and the other eleven have been standing up and been preaching the first gospel sermon. And now when they heard these, this, they were preaching their heart and said to Peter and the, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? do what shall we do let's do something what do we need to do we know we need to do something you just told us back in verse 22 that whosoever uh, call on the name of the Lord whoop sorry about that whosoever call on the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved so what are we supposed to do now all right because we know there's something you've told us there's something that we uh, that we need to do I'm sorry I said uh, 22, <clears throat> but it's uh, uh, not 22. It is... Draw a blank here. I know it's an Acts 2. 20, 21. Who shall call in the name of, uh, of the Lord shall be saved. So you know you got to call. So what shall we do is what they say in verse 37. So they know that there's something that they need to do. Well, what were they told to do? They were told to repent and be baptized. That's what they need to do. But verse 40 says something else. It says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Friends, there's some personal responsibility that you're going to have to take, not only in your secular life, not only in your life in regard to your family, with your, your, uh, towards your husband and your wife, or your wife, or your children, your parents, through uh, towards your, your 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 boss at work or your employees at work, but there's some personal responsibility you need to have toward God, and that is to save yourselves according to the plan that He's laid out. Save yourself. Do something. There's something for you to do. Notice this in Philippians two verse twelve, Paul writes. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Work out your own salvation. You mean I have to do something, Paul? You mean there's something that uh, there, there's something that I can I can do on my own? Yes, you have a responsibility. You have an obligation to make sure. To make sure of your of your salvation. Notice this in um, uh, first. So we get this right here. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Second, Second Peter, one, and we're going to look at about verse uh, uh, five. He said, "Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue." Well, now, why would you have to add? Why don't you have to add virtue and knowledge and, and temperance and grace and uh, uh, patience and godliness and brotherly kindness 
and charity. Why would you do this? For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither, neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar, and hath forgotten his purge from his own sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, why would you have to give diligence? For if, the, if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. What if you don't do them? Then you will fall. You have some responsibility, friends. You have some uh, uh, responsibility, some obligations to uh, when it comes to your, your, your personal salvation. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. How can you save yourself? You take your personal responsibility to obey the gospel. Friends, there is a plague of a failure of personal responsibility. It's not just in our society. It's in religion. Individuals don't take personal responsibility to study, to examine the scriptures, to find out if what they're being told is true, to find out if what, what the preacher's saying to them is it really in the Bible. Why don't you ask your preacher? Ask your preacher to show you, give you a book, chapter, and verse. Tell them to find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. We're offering $1,000 to anybody who can find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. Find, find a, a man-made denomination in the Bible. Can't do it. Find the church you're in in the Bible. By that I mean find the church that's organized like the one you're in, that, that teaches like the one you're in, you know, that has all the doctrines that come with it. Find the one that has, find the church in the Bible that has a, a creed book or a catechism uh, with it like the Baptists and the Methodists and Lutherans and so forth do. Can't find it. See? And so what we're, what we're trying to get you to see, friends, is you have an obligation to study these things, to find these things out. And we want to help you. We want to do what we can to help you. Friends, don't, don't shirk the responsibility. Responsibility is squarely on your shoulders. If we can help you, we want to do that very thing. Remember, we have uh, this book, Muscle and Shovel. It's, it's free to you. Not a member of the Church of Christ. It's free to you. We hope that you will take advantage of it. Just let us know. You can write me at wordoflord at gmail.com or call me at 276-340-2653. We'll be glad to get it out to you. Till next time, friends. Thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Star News. Right now, I'm Mark Childry coming to you from our studios in downtown Reedsville, North Carolina, on this Thursday. Now, we have a lot of news for you from all across the region. Our first story coming to us out of the Collinsville section of Henry County, Virginia. More on that in just a second. Charles Rourke is standing by to give us more on that. For our viewers watching in Rockingham County, we do want to let you know that we just received word just a moment ago from the Rockingham County school system that because of the prediction of extremely cold temperatures and wind chills down as close to zero tonight uh, as possible, uh, that it could possibly happen, then...